video is sponsored by LG. Today we're talking about the ideal viewer experience, and for that you need this LG OLED TV. Click below to get the best possible deal on this beautiful, immersive cinematic TV. So, what you binging these days? What everyone's binging these days, that's how we consume content. What is today's viewer experience doing to our heads? Diving down TikTok rabbit holes, binge watching hours of YouTube and Netflix, streaming big budget movies on small phone screens, and passively consuming music on an algorithmic mood playlist. Being a viewer today is all encompassing yet fragmented, immersive and interactive, yet at other times passive and perhaps overwhelming. A lot of voices lament what has been or could be lost. If you're playing the movie on a telephone, you you will never in a trillion years experience the film. And it's true that treasured art forms like classic cinema, movie theaters, and the artist-driven musical album need guardians and champions. On the other hand, alarmist panicked headlines about how art and our brains are being irrevocably damaged don't tell the whole story, because there are also many hopeful developments and inclusive opportunities in this whole evolution. Here's our take on how exactly the viewer experience is morphing, and the potential in what it's turning us viewers into. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. So first things first, have human attention spans really become shorter than that of a goldfish? In 2015, a study from Microsoft went viral with the takeaway that the human attention span had shortened to less than 10 seconds. Researchers say humans are now averaging about eight seconds of uninterrupted focus while goldfish are believed to have at least nine seconds of concentration. It didn't take long for people to blame this on social media, digestible bite-sized content forms, and the fact that we're reading the internet instead of books. All I gotta do is put my mind to this shit. But when the BBC's Simon Mabin followed up on that original study, the data sources couldn't be verified. Dr. Gemma Briggs tells the BBC that average attention span is kind of meaningless because how much attention we give depends on what each task demands. A better way to frame this conversation is that our attention is not shortening, but changing because we're putting it toward different entertainment related tasks. Yes, we still watch or read for stretches of hours and hours, but this might take the form of TikTok and YouTube rabbit holes, opening up Wikipedia tab after tab or binging episodes in a show. Thus, the content stream is separated into smaller chunks, so it's a long form yet segmented or episodic experience. After each content by ends, you have the option to engage and click which of the following options you're automatically served up. But if you don't click, sometimes within a few brief seconds, we're looking at you Netflix, you're shuffled along to the next Netflix autoplay and Spotify playlist selection, floating down a stream while doing very little to select or even be aware of who made this art or what it's called. Thus, the viewer today is a contradictory mix of both passive and active. Let's look at the active part first. Audiences are flocking to interactivity in content experiences that make them participants. Obviously, you have the the huge popularity of gaming, testifying to how much people want long-form interactive storytelling, plus the gamification of TV. How about you decide what you want for your breakfast? As Black Mirror's Bandersnatch Choose Your Own Adventure episode has been replicated by You vs. Wild, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, and Boss Baby. Twitch is doubly interactive as we can talk to streamers while we vicariously partake in their interactive gaming. If there's one word to sum up what many viewers want out of all of these immersive, interactive, personality-driven experiences, it's closeness. Authenticity may be something of an overused buzzword today, but that feeling of unpolished, authentic intimacy is clearly a huge driver towards platforms like YouTube and TikTok, where glossy production value isn't necessarily a plus and may even be off-putting. In a world where so much feels fake or commercialized, the DIY aesthetic of creators on these platforms can make it feel like you're getting an actual window into their lives and thoughts. I wanna try and start working out three or four times a week. I said this before, I mean it. I mean it this time, guys. This closeness is also being achieved between viewers, listeners, or gamers, to the point that we're forming communities and tribes around the stuff we love. I'm Susanna McCulloch, and if you haven't noticed, I care a lot about the viewer experience. We at The Take watch a lot of films and TV shows to make these video essays, probably the best part of our job. So it was serendipity that this video sponsor, LG, brought the OLED TV into my life. The LG OLED 4K TV is for me the best way to get that immersive cinema experience at home. 
So do yourself a favor, click the link in our description below and get an unbeatable price on this beautiful TV before the holiday season. So to explain why this TV looks so great, let's get into the viewer experience science. Standard LED and LCD TVs are backlit, so this can create a kind of unattractive halo effect. With the OLED display, the pixels actually create their own light. So what this translates to is a richer, more evocative picture. You get these velvety pitch blacks that you can normally only see in a movie theater. So, what you binging these days? What everyone's binging these days, that's how we consume content. Exactly as the director intended. There's also Dolby Vision IQ, which intelligently adjusts the brightness, color, and sharpness of each frame according to the ambient light in your room, showing you the most detailed picture. And the LG TV supports Dolby Atmos, so you can enjoy real 3D sound at home, just like in the theaters, without the need for a further sound system. You've got Motion Pro, which reduces blurring, so it's perfect for sports, action sequences. The gaming capacities are lightning fast. No matter what you are watching or playing, it looks and sounds incredible. This is like ridiculously thin. This is the kind of beautiful TV that does justice to how the best movies, shows, and games should look. Click the link in our description below, get your own LG OLED TV, and bring the ideal viewer experience into your home. In 1969, media theorist Marshall McLuhan predicted that a more interconnected world would lead to a retribalizing effect. And in this description, we see the roots of stan culture. Artists foster these tribes by giving away more of themselves to their fans, and fans provide services to other fans that you might expect the band to do, like organizing meetups or translating content into other languages. Fan translators, who translate this content from Korean to other languages for free on their own time. You get a sense that you're doing something for community. Subscriber Platforms like Patreon or My Favorite Murders Fan Cult allow fans a specific place where they can bond and even influence the content they're uniting through. In the never-ending struggle of making friends in a new city, I've been able to bond with many people over this podcast. In this climate, the discussion about a work has become almost as primary and important as the watching itself. Social media has turned consuming culture into communal multimedia events. Scandal's cast and creator, Shonda Rhimes, live tweeting the show along with fans, known as gladiators, saved it from being canceled and grew the audience by over 50%. We really kind of created a new thing with Scandal. It's made Scandal appointment viewing. The idea of on Thursday night at nine o'clock, Everybody can get on Twitter and have this communal experience. Even what we do at The Take is all about discussing and thinking deeply about the culture all around us to get the most out of movies, shows, and music. Getting memed is a huge part of a show or movie becoming a hit today. So much so that memification is built into marketing strategies, and it's common for shows to be released with accompanying podcasts. Okay, so this week on Succession. And the launch of the social media app Clubhouse is built all around this desire for a shared discussion space. People come to Clubhouse to talk about it, to be with other people in the moment. No wonder the concept is already being copied by Twitter and Facebook. The downside to the discussion becoming everything is that it can make what that art is truly expressing less important. Everybody has a lot to say about the latest content controversy, whether it's 13 Reasons Why's depiction of mental health, Tiger King inspired debates about who killed Carol Baskin's husband, or Netflix staff's walkout over transphobic comments in Dave Chappelle's closer. Even if they haven't watched the show, or movie in question in its entirety. It's a situation that can flatten and remove nuance from any conversation. Moreover, there are fears that even fewer people are watching and keeping older cultural classics alive. Movie theaters seem like endangered species, and 30% of millennials have reportedly never seen a black and white movie. It's hard to blame them when they're so little exposed. There's a glaring recency emphasis on platforms like Netflix, which don't really put a lot into curating great classic movie offerings. Beyond just the question of black and white or color, Color, cinema looks hugely different today than it did 50, 30, or even 10 years ago. Look at how today's shots are full of shallow depths of field. The way everything is out of focus here, except her face, and focus pulls, so one object or person is in focus, and then another, not both at once. Many of cinema's beloved classics are full of deep focus. Take any acclaimed 70s film and see how much more we can look at simultaneously in the frame, as well as how different the colors of the film look. According to psychologist James Cutting's research,
search, average shot length has gotten shorter from 12 seconds in 1930 to 2.5 seconds now, and choreographed long takes are increasingly rare. As digital cameras have replaced film ones in most situations, this obviously makes the costs of filming far more accessible. But in addition to the aesthetic costs of what's lost giving up celluloid, this whole shallow focus aesthetic can feel less real. Take a look at The Sopranos, shot on 35mm film, clearly in a very understated no-frills style. This isn't a movie, it's a TV show, but it's shot on 35mm film. It uses the same cameras, equipment, techniques. Versus its 2021 prequel, The Many Saints of Newark, shot on the digital area Alexa camera. The update maybe looks more aesthetically pleasing and polished on the surface, yet that pleasingness is distancing, somehow lessens the sense of reality that characterized the original series. By looking back at older cinema, we can try to translate some of what was so great about them into what we watch and how we look today. 2021's The Card Counter and 2017's First Reform from Paul Schrader, who wrote Taxi Driver, demonstrate how, even when shooting on digital with all of today's tools, you can channel aesthetic strategies from past classics to retain that cinematic mood and the feeling of reality that derives from not overdoing the aesthetic. I used that same freedom in First Reformed not to move the camera, to be restrained, to be ascetic. Nobody could pressure me to do anything quote unquote commercial if I didn't feel like it. And more broadly, it's important to chronicle, protect, and learn from classic cinema. But is it true that streaming will spell the end for movie theaters and cinema classics? Well, not quite. Global box office and audiences were at a record high in 2019 before the pandemic. And while attendances did fall in North America, they'd been going up prior to 2019, and overall revenue was up from higher ticket prices. So it's not all doom and gloom. Moreover, in today's fragmented media age where it's harder and harder to launch new mega shows or movies we all watch, nostalgia movies and shows take on a special unifying power and can get new lives as younger fans discover them in new formats. Just look at all our videos on everything from The Matrix, Mean Girls, Casablanca, and American Psycho to The Sopranos, Mad Men, and Breaking Bad. TikTok, too, is helping people rediscover old music hits, leading to surges in popularity for bands like Fleetwood Mac. Now, returning to our active-passive dichotomy, on the other end of the spectrum, from all the interactive, zealous engagement, passive, mindless consuming is more seamless and tailored to us than ever before, and we're embracing it because we're paralyzed by choice. With so many options to choose from, people find it very difficult to choose at all. Choice paralysis makes third-party curation very appealing. Whether that's a clothing or goods subscription service, a viewing platform like Mubi that adds one quality film per day, or the rise of playlisting culture like Spotify's Discover Weekly algorithm. Weirdly, overcome by too many options, we might just forego new stuff altogether and burrow into the coziness of comfort food TV we've seen a hundred times before. See, the huge price tag streamers like Netflix have paid for old hits, and the huge ones Warner Media and NBC Universal turned down to move Friends and The Office, respectively, onto their own platforms. Apart from these long-established behemoths, though, in many spaces today, we have weakening relationships with any specific artist or piece of art, and our most direct relationship is with the platform that feeds us this quote-unquote content. Look, I made you some content. The success of any given film or show today is limited by what platform it's on. The New York Times reported the third season of American Crime Story Impeachment saw poor viewership numbers, despite big stars and a ton of media coverage, due to not being available to stream to non-cable viewers for 10 more months. This was also true the first two seasons of the anthology series in 2016 and 2018, but the show's viewers have dropped steadily as people move off of cable. And as the streaming wars are decided in the next few years, and even the all-important live sports start to show up on streamers, the idea that any single piece of content, however delectable, is going to lure you off Netflix onto yet another new platform, or God forbid, back to cable, will become ever more unlikely. Platforms are also shaping the nature and format of the art we watch. We'll see people uh, creating and releasing music in, uh, in novel ways, releasing instead of albums, maybe they'll release a song uh, a week. For, uh, for 20 weeks. The artist-crafted album is giving way to algorithm-formed mood playlists, and a 2019 study found out that these playlists effectively replace musical genres for listeners who now group acts together according to associated mood or activities like running or working out. All right, sexy playlist check. Seductive voice, double check. Artists are writing songs with the writing timing and hooks to break them on TikTok. I wanted it to go. Um, I wanted there to be like a little like 
thing in it because I wanted people to make TikToks where they could like transition into it. And user relationship can be with the platform over the artist to such an extent that there are fake artists on Spotify who've racked up billions of streams but seem to exist nowhere else. Today's streaming business model benefits the platform but disempowers artists. Many millions of streams can add up to only a few thousand pounds. Or at least it means a lot of people can have a little success, but it's much harder to hit it big. The ascendancy of the binge watch has turned TV into a kind of therapy, whether you view that as a stress relief tool or a full-blown addiction. Have you ever wondered why you feel down once you finally come to the end of a series? Those 142 binge watchers reported higher levels of stress, anxiety, and depression than the 266 people who didn't identify as being binge watchers. Clinical psychologist Dr. Renee Carr argues that binge watching replicates an experience of addiction, saying, when binge watching your favorite show, your brain is continuing continually producing dopamine, and your body experiences a drug-like high. You experience a pseudo-addiction to the show because you develop cravings for dopamine. I heard that, that you make these things that way. Addictive. All they do is tweak it like that on purpose. They got dopamine targets. Even if the attention span isn't actually shortening, the widely held belief that it is is almost a self-fulfilling prophecy, leading to media that desperately strives to grab us in the first few seconds. A ding is to grab your attention. Red is to alert you. A notification is to click. Our devices are designed with our psychology in mind. And as we hit peak streaming wars, there are a lot of kinds of content and competing platforms vying for the commodity of our attention. Meanwhile, as Google, Siri, or Alexa answer our questions and schedule our calendars, and Amazon Prime delivers our packages in as little as hours, we're living in an age where we feel we should never have to wait for anything. I'm so bored. Bring the party over, Draglexa! Woo! Draglexa here! The irony of this is that instant gratification doesn't make us happy. A University of Missouri study found that the peak of positive emotions in a consumer experience comes just before a purchase is made. We actually benefit from looking forward and, yes, having to wait. That's why there's been pushback from creators against binging. Kids these days. Everything is binge, binge, binge. Yeah. You'll never know the pleasure of waiting for just a crumb of what you want. After Netflix launched a tool to help viewers speed up their shows, director Brad Bird described it as another cut to the already bleeding out cinema experience. And some of today's most buzzed about shows, like Apple TV's Ted Lasso, HBO's Succession and White Lotus, Disney Plus's WandaVision and The Mandalorian, and Hulu's Only Murders in the Building, have all benefited from the more old-fashioned weekly release model, which combats post-binge malaise and probably creates a more memorable, positive viewer experience in the long run. As WandaVision director Matt Shackman said, there's something about the mystery, where people can think about what they've watched and come up with their own theories and it builds anticipation. Binging before bed can also make us so invested in a story we struggle to switch off. And it's important to take breaks from our screens, because screen fatigue is real and it's making us exhausted. Screens are everywhere. We are controlled by screens. We're watching so much content on TVs, tablets, phones, and laptops that it's actually wearing out our eyes. Digital eye strain can be caused by factors like sitting too close to the screen, using the wrong settings on your devices, and staring at your computer and smartphone for long periods at a time. Our sleep cycles are so damaged that, ironically, we have to binge another form of content, ASMR, to get some shut eye. The truth is that technology undeniably alters the viewer experience, but exactly how can be complicated and hard to predict in real time. A panic took hold when Amazon released the Kindle, with many fearing it would spell the end of physical books. But actually, physical book sales are increasing as ebooks plateau. 3D, after a few false attempts, finally took hold in big movie theaters, but it still hasn't fundamentally changed most of the average viewer experience and hasn't been widely adopted at home. It's almost certain that virtual reality technology will be embraced by the mainstream, but what that will look like remains anybody's guess. If I can't make it to Paris, um, you'll have, you know, hologram mark, um, sitting on the couch next to you. Ultimately, as we undergo this period of rapid change, it's important to protect and patronize the things you care about preserving, like the cinema, cultural classics, or independent creators over big platforms. And maybe, with all this competition, less stuff will go stratospheric or hang around as long. But there's also a lot to be excited about for tomorrow's viewers. New creative forms are opening up and expanding the ecosystem, which can lead to more voices getting heard. The viewer experience is evolving, not just in what we're given, but in how we react, because we, the viewers, are evolving the experience too. I am excited for a world 
where our entertainment could connect us instead of isolating us. This is the take on your favorite movie shows and pop culture. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.